This episode of the Gondrepreneur Podcast is made possible by Evergreen Gateway, a provider of cannabis-friendly financial services. As many cannabis entrepreneurs have experienced firsthand, it can be very difficult to get approval for essential financial services once your bank finds out what industry you're in. Evergreen Gateway makes it easy for cannabis entrepreneurs to access the financial resources that you need to operate your business. From merchant accounts to cash advances, virtual checking, and depository banking, Evergreen Gateway has established solutions that cater to the specific needs of the cannabis industry. Get in touch today at evergreengateway.com. Hey there, I'm your host, TG Brandfall. Thank you for listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of entrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Today, I'm joined by Barry and Brent Walker. They're the founders of California-based Dub Brothers, uh, one of the state's largest license holders, uh, which also operates in Oklahoma. Uh, the company's brands include Tradecraft Farms, Sticky Vapes, and Cali Roots Dispensaries, and they also spearhead... Uh, charitable efforts, including the Gobble, Gobble, Give, and Skid Row Christmas. How are you guys doing this afternoon? Great. Good. So uh, stoked to have you guys on. Uh, you know, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, before we get into, you know, the, the history of Cali Roots and, and all the work that you guys do, uh, tell me about yourselves. How did you end up in the cannabis space? Go ahead. All right, yeah, I can take it. Uh, I, started, I started about 11, 12 years ago. Uh, actually growing in a shipping container in San Diego. Uh, I saw that the medical industry was was starting to boom, so I tried to jump in a little early. Uh, from there, I did a delivery service and then eventually partnered with Barry, my brother, and we moved to L.A. together and uh, started opening up a larger cultivation. Uh, we opened up dispensaries, um, this was all back in the day, uh, and then we've just, you know, recently obtained licensing in the last year and a half. How about you, Barry? How did you end up uh, working yeah. with your brother? Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we've, we've told this story a few times, but, uh, you know, Brent, uh, I was, uh, I had a lot of retail businesses uh, through the Silver Lake area, the East Hollywood, back when it was booming, and um, I was... Uh, doing a lot of businesses when Brent approached me and uh, you know he is uh, I think it's one of my businesses is health and wellness I was in uh, spas yoga um, you know we had uh, different lifestyle type businesses that they cater towards the health and wellness so um, I don't know if I was a perfect fit or not but um, Brent is very good at his craft he had a very big vision and um, you know and approached me to uh, you know sort of help uh, manage what, what we both realized would be much bigger down the road. And I think it was a battle for him at first. Cause I was like, nah, 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 you know, I'm, I'm 20 years sober. Um, so I, I, you know, so I was doing sort of that inner struggle, like, okay, you know, what are we doing here? Is it real? Is it, does it really help? And, you know, Brent really guided me on the medicinal uh, benefits of, of cannabis. Uh, I started doing a lot of my own research and after a while I was hooked and I, and I, I jumped in a hundred percent and uh, you know, uh, I think together we, we, we really, we really round each other off. You know, we're, we're, we're brothers. So, <laughs> you know, so it, it, having business partners is, you know, is tough having business partners with your brother, you know, we're always like, you know, you know, we're always uh, looking at different sides of the coin and trying to figure things out, but we really complement each other. And uh, so uh, I, I, it was, you know, it's a great move, you know. What was it like for you going from, you know, a traditional, you know, sort of being being successful in, in traditional businesses to moving to something, you know, as nascent and, and new as cannabis? Yeah, it's, um, again, I think because I was in health and wellness, there was already there was already a, a conversation about that for me, um, you know, and, and Brent coming in uh, so strong and such an activist and already, you know, already, you know, being a grower and, and seeing the vision and understanding where medical was going. Um, it was, um, it, it was an eye opener for me, but it's, it's been interesting because 
um, you know, it is, it is a different business. I mean, when, when me and Brent started Dub Brothers, we literally had to look outside our door before we moved product into a vehicle, you know, like, oh, wow. like it was a different, it was a different time and it was, it was legal. But it wasn't legal. But it was legal. But it wasn't totally legal. But it was okay. But it wasn't all that okay, you know? There was this weird space. And I would have to turn back to Brent all the time, and he'd be like, it's okay, man. Trust me. It's okay. And I'd be like, oh, you know, this isn't like running a yoga studio, you know? <laughs> Uh, so, so uh, Brent, maybe this question's more up your alley. Tell me about the history of Cali Roots, because I, you know, I, as I said, I, I haven't spent much time in in California, and and it's a brand that I'm I'm very familiar with. Yeah. So we, uh, my my actually my my our dad, one of his best friends, they grew up in Kansas, so just one state over, uh, and his and his friend John reached out to us and said, "Hey, it's going legal, and, and there's no merit-based system. You can just apply and get in." So my first thought was like, "Well, I'm pretty confident in what we do, and I know we can do it well. So let's. This is kind of a cool kind of test to see if we can compete on an open market." Um, so that was kind of that was the thought of it, and then we, uh, you know, we just started going out there and finding locations. We actually got in really early, right in the very beginning. Um, so it helped us lock down spaces for a lot cheaper because, you know, landlords out here in California just rip you. It's like $3 a square foot sometimes, uh, out there, they had no clue because it had never existed before. So we were able to get in at just like a low market rate, uh, for our cultivation and our retail. Um, so that helped a lot. Also just being the first out there helped a lot, but, uh, yeah, we have, you know, so we went out there and found found the cultivation spot first, um, locked that down. We actually got it right next to the uh, the airport there in Oklahoma City, so it's kind of easy if I fly in and fly out. Um, so we did that, and then we started opening stores. So we've been, you know, it's been going on for about a year and a half, I think, and uh, we just opened our fifth store about a month ago in Edmond. So we have we have five locations. We have one in OKC. Uh, we have the one in Edmond that just opened. We have one in Stillwater that's right next to the State College, which just crushes it. Uh, and then we have one by uh, by the university in Norman. Um, and then we have, what else do we have, Barry? We got one in the uh, uh, fifth one in the nicer part of town. Um, I don't know. But anyway, so that, that was kind of the... That's kind of the approach that we took to it. Uh, we've seen that, you know, Nickel out Hills. of the gate, Nickel Hills. Out of the gate, we did, we, you know, we did really well. Uh, our whole concept is Cali. We're bringing Cali strains to Oklahoma because we know everyone loves the Cali stuff. Um, we do a lot of in-house breeding. We work uh, closely with sea junkies, which are like the breeders of wedding cake and a lot of these uh, Cushmans, a lot of famous strains. Uh, so we're going to be bringing all that out there too soon. Um, but yeah, um, that's kind of where we took off. And and then, you know, we've seen in the last, I'd say last four months have been a little difficult because there were so many mom and pops that were opening up. There was thousands of them. So we, we think we hit that plateau a, a few months ago and a lot of them are falling off now. So you're starting to see just some of the larger companies that are able to stick around through the storm. Uh, but I think we're still kind of in the end of that storm. So I think, you know, in the next three to four months, uh, we're going to, we're going to look pretty good out there. And then when it goes recreational, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're set up for it. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about sort of the, the Oklahoma and, and that sort of thing. But I got to ask you, I, I had read that you guys describe yourselves as, as downtown Los Angeles skid row farmer. Um, what, what is what is downtown Los Angeles skid row farmer? Go ahead, Barry. Well, OK, yeah, this is this is a good one for me. So so uh, so we so we we'll get into philanthropy. So we we uh, we every year we host a large uh, feed the homeless uh, event through the holiday season. Uh, Thanksgiving to Christmas, we're feeding homeless. We'll do thirty five thousand meals a year, 
Wow. I started it like 20 years ago um, in Silver Lake, but um, but we've really with with the with the uh, with the, the the strength and stability of the of the company, we've been able to really expand it. We're in we're in about 25 cities throughout the country now, um, and uh, and we do a lot of work with Skid Row. That's kind of what I'm coming back to. Is it you know we 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 aren't afraid of Skid Row because we deal with it you know, on a regular basis, we, we're, we're constantly, you know, we, we do things, we'll hand out, you know, food, clothing, our, our, our Skid Row Christmas event is a big, you know, a big musical event with some top, you know, top name acts, and, you know, it's a black and white affair, and we hand out, for, you know, Santa Claus shows up, the, the Los Angeles Car Club shows up, so all the lowriders and, and, uh, and autos come with the cars, and we take presents down to Skid Row and drop them off people, tents, sleeping bags, uh, canned food, just all that stuff. Uh, re- rechargeable solar lighting, which is really, uh, really they really dig that. Um, but, so we're, we're, we're not afraid of Skid Row. So we built our headquarters down right smack dab in the center of Skid Row. Uh, wow. And uh, whenever we invite people over, we're, we have to have that little meeting with them. We go, okay, so here's the deal. All right, it's going to be a little scary at first, but once you get in behind the gates, it's 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 beautiful. <laughs> but but as you're parking your car, it might be a little, you, you might get a little freaked out. And and it is, and we have people come from all over the country, sometimes from out of the country, and they're they're honestly they've never seen anything like it. And uh, I always wonder, you know, when, when people are exposed to that for the first time, you know, they leave there a little different. They understand that this is a pretty huge problem. And, uh, and uh, you know, through our, through our cannabis company, we, we do what we can. But it's good for other people to leave our headquarters and to, to now know that it exists. You know, and they're free to do what they want. But... Um, you know, but so so we're downtown. We're 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 local downtown Los Angeles Skid Row farmers, and uh, we have multiple facilities downtown LA. Brent has designed each one of those, and uh, and we have quite a footprint downtown. D- does it have a sort of different meaning uh, for you, Brent? No, I mean the idea to move to LA from San Diego is, you know. <laughs> That when it was medical and, and kind of in that gray area, I couldn't do it anywhere else. Like the epicenter was downtown LA. So that's where we were the safest. I mean, we've been through multiple raids over the years, but downtown LA was safer than, you know, North Hollywood, you know, Orange County, San Diego. Uh, so that was, that was kind of the concept. Um, we have so many locations now and the reason being is, because we've always had C to sell, we've always had retail, is that when one location was raided, we would be able to have a backup. So that's the reason why we had multiple, they're not small, they're like, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 square foot facilities, you know, about five or six of them between downtown LA. But that was kind of the concept for that. Uh, you know, you got other brands like Jungle Boys that, we're kind of our neighbors coming up over the last 10 years. Uh, so there is kind of that, that following of kind of that urban grower, that downtown LA grower, a lot of the strains, a lot of the popular stuff is coming out of LA, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at. So tell me about the, tell me about your brands, Tradecraft Farm, Sticky Vapes. Um, you know, wh- what is, f- for you, what are you sort of thinking about when you're trying to, you know, name a brand and, and design a product for that brand? Well, the uh, name Tradecraft was a, was a strong name. Uh, it's used in government uh, kind of, you know, I don't want to say, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's what, it's what terrorists are good at their trade. So it's called a trade craft. The government uses it. And I heard it one time and I was like, that's a cool name. Uh, it was strong. Our, our logo is a badger, a honey badger. So you got honey, honey oil, cannabis oil. Also that the badger is very resilient. It's a strong animal. Um, I just thought it was kind of cool. So we went with that as our mascot. Um, so that's the concept behind Tradecraft Farms. Uh, like I said, it's all grown in downtown LA. So we really market it around, uh, you know, being LA growers. 
and then sticky vape sticky vape was something that we started years ago and we only had in-house so like we came up with the name we, we came up with the logo years ago and never really used it uh we kind of we had all the big brands like open you know back in the day and all these big vape brands that that we were carrying in our stores and we kept our stuff in there kind of like a white label cartridge just to see if we can compete with the big dogs and eventually we launched it and we've done we've done very well you know uh so those are our two those are our two big brands uh the sticky vape is also like uh, our socal surfer we're kind of trying to go after kind of the red bull marketing idea like we sponsor snowboarders and pro surfers and pro skaters uh graffiti artists we work we work with uh risk risk is a big graffiti artist here in la um so that's kind of the socal beach life uh cannabis vape line that we have what's it like for you barry coming from a traditional sort of you know background and now you know having to design you know work in the in this aspect of cannabis you know coming up with brands yeah it's um it's uh one thing we left out uh we're, we're launching better days bakery which is a, a gluten-free vegan uh bake line huh. uh which we're really excited about we were actually supposed to launch it at the hall of flowers show uh about four days ago but of course uh yeah. that was uh that was called off due to the coronavirus uh fears and uh but um uh, and we also have a really incredible incubator program we're, we're launching a few uh, brands that we're really excited about and uh, stay tuned for all of that stuff but you know again there's another story that i kind of tell you know it's like when when brent asked me to to, to partner up with him and join him on this uh this crusade you know as it was at the time you know um you know it was there was a bit of a learning curve you know right like like yeah. he was teaching me how to like grow, you know, and, and, and we were just sort of in the very first part of what would become a very complex puzzle from us to become a seed to sale company. You know, now we, 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 we cultivate, we manufacture, we distribute and we retail, you know, all under, you know, multiple roofs, you know, under the desk. But, um, you know, in all fairness, we started out as just pot farmers. And now, you know, I just had a two hour meeting with our lobbyists and politicians. Um, we're working with, uh, we've got, you know, uh, we, we've, we've reached so far out, you know, we're, we're purchasing property all over the country where uh, it's really developed into, into quite, a, quite a company. So it's, it's exciting because in honesty, cannabis has delivered to me something that I would have expected a traditional company to, de to, to deliver but it's delivered at, at such a faster rate, at such a faster pace. You know, it's it's literally been on steroids since day one. We've just been moving 180 miles an hour from the moment we wake up to the moment we pass out from exhaustion, you know? It's, it's, it's really exciting. For both of you guys, is this where you expected this to go? I mean, you know, most people would say, yeah, of course, you know, I'm a brilliant businessman. This is exactly where I expected to be. But I mean, it sounds like, you know, just just as you're telling me the story that you're, you're almost surprised. You know, I'll, I'll jump in. I think that, I think we both had different answers on that one. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think I think Brent had a you know, I'll let Brent answer, but I, I think he had this vision long ago, you know, about how big it could be. Um, I think maybe me coming in from traditional, having so much experience in traditional business, I was maybe a bit more skeptical. I was like, well, it's a lot of hard work and boy, it takes a lot of time. And, you know, and, and he was always like, you'll see, you'll see, you know, and uh, sure enough. Yeah. It's uh, it's, I think it surprised me. Uh, but I, I, I'd love for Brent to answer too. Yeah, no, I mean, I kind of I kind of saw that this was going to happen and unfold the way it has. Um, I don't know why I say that. I just, something in my gut uh, told me that. Uh, I just knew that that's where I needed to be, you know, 12 years ago. Um, I could see the power it had um, ethically, you know, with, with the people coming through our stores with their hair wrapped up because they're going through chemo. Um, it was just very powerful. Yeah. Uh, so I knew this was going to be big. I mean, cause you got alcohol, 
you know, cannabis, cannabis has been around forever. Um, Literally. So yeah, I just, I, I knew, I knew at some point it could probably even be bigger than alcohol. And we're not, we're not even there yet, you know? Um, Cause it's just, it, it, it it's just on a broad level. It, it, it works for almost everybody, but there's just so many people that haven't tried it yet, you know? So people are being introduced to like CBD and, and CBG and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not surprised where we're at right now. Um, I'm a little more, I, I, I guess I'm a little more confused now than I was back then of where it's going just because there's so much going on right now. It, you know, we're all over the place. Like we do everything, you know, we're not just an extraction company or just a retail store. Like we do everything and, and, you know, eventually, yeah, you know, there's probably, we'll probably get bought out at some point, but I'm not going anywhere. This is what I love to do. This is my passion, you know? So I'm going to be in this for, for years, you know, I'm not young, but I'm, I'm 41. Um, so ideally we're just at the tip of the iceberg right now. So, so, I mean, speaking of sort of tips of icebergs and, and, you know, we can sort of talk about, you know, what's happening with legalization, but I want to ask you about Oklahoma. Uh, you guys are the first uh, guests I've had on that have uh, any uh, experience uh, in that state. And so I'm wondering first, you know, why did you decide to get into the Oklahoma market? And then second, are you guys, what's your take on the early success of Oklahoma's industry? They have 220,000 plus patients. That's 5% of the state population. Uh, they expect $350 million in sales this year. So why Oklahoma and, and you know, what's driving sort of these good numbers? I mean, kind of like I said before, we, you know, we, 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 we do what we do very well. Um, if I, if you bring it all the way back to the plant where it starts, I feel like we can compete on that level. There could be 5,000 stores and I know we can still compete. Uh, it might not be as good as, as an area where they cap licensing, like in California, but you know, if you, if you have stores in the right regions, you're going to do very well. And when I say it goes back to the plant, it goes back to the way I design our cultivation facility. So we, you know, we still use our traditional grow lights, which are a thousand watt HPS. But recently we've transitioned into uh, full spectrum LEDs in rack systems. We use rolling rack systems. In, in Oklahoma, we have three levels high in our full rooms. We have, uh, we have eight rooms, about a hundred lights in each room. Um, so we can produce flower that's very beautiful at a very low cost so that's kind of the concept behind the cultivation and then you know we just we build the energy and, and the culture within our retail uh and and people see it you know and like i said before people want that cali they want those cali strains because it's not in all the stores out there you know every state is different but um so that's that's kind of the concept you have anything to, to, to add, Barry, about, you know, why you guys uh, chose Oklahoma and, and, you know, what may be driving the early success of Oklahoma's uh, medical cannabis industry? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, Oklahoma did it much differently. You know, they made it more of a registration process as opposed to an application process. So, um, you know, we were the first to rush out there. You're seeing a lot of the bigger boys are coming out now and, uh, and setting up shop. But, um, you know, we're, so, so to answer the question, I mean, really it's a timing thing, right? We'll, we'll look at any city that's friendly, and we have for the last few years. Like any city in California or outside of California, any city that's got a, you know, an initiative or a, uh, you know, uh, a majority voting block and a city council that says, hey, no, we get it, we understand it, we like it. We'd like to make some money from it. We would like to be there, you know. And and uh, we we love Oklahoma. I mean, we're we're Kansas boys, you know. I was born in Wichita. Uh, Brent wasn't, but um, <laughs> you know, our family's from Kansas. I got out of Kansas when I was young, but you know, but we're it's still that's that's our family roots out there. So we get the Midwest, and the Midwest is a great place to set up a distribution hub uh, for other states. You know, once it starts to become a bit more federally legal or you can start to cross state lines um so so oklahoma makes sense 
but we're we're in love with uh, with Missouri, of course. Uh, we're in love with uh, Michigan. Uh, we're in love with Illinois and uh, New Jersey. You know, these are all states that are that are starting to move in that direction. And uh, so, uh, you know, becoming that bigger company that I was talking about, where we're not just you know pot farmers anymore. We're not just guys growing you know, growing cannabis, like we're starting to put together, you know, action plans for, for nationwide, you know, um, you know, multiple state operations. And it's tricky. It's tricky, you know? Yeah. So, so uh, just recently, uh, Oklahoma uh, advocates had been uh, trying to get signatures. And so I'm wondering, it was effectively shut down by the coronavirus rules, right? They had to, they had to stop. Uh, it, was, it was shut down by the Secretary of State. Um, you know, you said that, you, you know, you obviously are watching this, watching what's going on in Oklahoma. Uh, do you guys think, what was the sort of trajectory of that legalization position? Was it petition? Was it positioned uh, to be approved before, uh, before it was shut down? Uh, you got, which one are you talking about? Are you talking about for recreational? Yeah. I mean, you know, the and Brent knows this too. He can answer this too. But the the obvious next step, anytime there's medical, the next step is recreational. Every single city council, everybody's every single city that has, you know, sort of hemmed and hawed and dragged their feet and been like, well, we don't know, we don't know. Okay, we'll allow it medical and see what happens. Like six months later, they're like, hey, this is great. Let's do recreational. I mean, very quickly, they're, you know, and, and Oklahoma is a conservative neighborhood, but they're also very, uh, you know, they're also anti big government. So they're, you know, they're more like, you know, just like, let's just run it, you know? So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. You know, obviously, coronavirus is sort of, you know, made everything, you know, it's changed the game for everything, you know, on a short-term basis, hopefully not long-term. But, um, you know, I, I see Oklahoma going recreational with or without any sort of initiatives. What was your sort of feeling on that, on uh, what was going on in, with regard to the petition, Brent? I didn't really look into it, so I, I can't really say on that. Um, I just know it's, uh, there's a lot of religion in, in Oklahoma, so... There's going to still be a lot of backlash regarding that. Um, you know, uh, if it stays medical, I think I think we're still going to do well. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, still, the, the patient numbers five percent of the population. I mean, that's that's incredible. Yeah, and like we have a store in San Diego. We did an initiative years ago, and we wrote it before it was even recreational in California, and we got it passed recently. And, and we had to open up as medical. And you know, everywhere else in San Diego, there's been there's been recreational for uh, you know a good year. Uh, so what we had to do is we actually eat the the, the doctor script. You know, we kind of give the store we give them store credit for whatever they spend on their doctor script. Yeah. So in essence, it is kind of recreational, but then there's a lot of people that are still a little concerned because their gun holders are their yeah. nurses are, you know, they're they're afraid they're going to be flagged online somewhere. Um, so I mean, we still have that everywhere, but uh, you know, it, it, at some point, like Barry said, it, it is going to go, and and you know, we'll be ready for it. And you mentioned that that you guys are eyeing Missouri. Um, what 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 is the medical cannabis industry potential there, and what are the rec use prospects there? Because that petition process too was also shut down by coronavirus rules. Yeah. Well, there, I'll, I'll I'll answer this. This is Barry. Um, so we so um, so there's a very large appeal process actually going on in Missouri right now. I think that's that's the part that's uh, that's really shut everything down. Um, but um, we have uh, we have we have good relations in Missouri. We've actually been feeding the homeless out there for five years uh, out in Kansas City. Um, so you know, so we're we're actually sort of ingrained in the in the neighborhoods and in the community already. Um, but uh, we we feel that Missouri's. I mean, I think anywhere you have 
uh, senior citizens, anywhere you have, um, you know, uh, military veterans, anywhere you have people that, you know, are susceptible to cancer or rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, any, any of the other uh, ailments that, that cannabis can, can help, um, you're, it's, it's a good town. It's a good city. Uh, we love Missouri. We love Kansas City. We love St. Louis. Um, we've made some really great friends out there. Uh, we've got our fingers crossed, you know, um, but I, I see it. Um, I see it being just as strong as, as any other, you know, when you get into the, into the metropolitan, you get into the cities, just as strong as any other, you know, city in California. I, I mean, I might, you know, people might yell at me for saying that it's not California, but you know, but it's, uh, you know, it's still a big city and there's a lot of people and uh, it's densely populated and people, uh, you know, the, the majority of people approve of cannabis, uh, even See, in those like, more conservative towns. We're the, you know, we're the white brothers coming from California that are trying to go into your state. Uh, so there is some issue with that. You know, most of these states, you have to partner with a local resident. Um, but, uh, you know, it's tough. Uh, Missouri was tough because it's, you know, mostly African-American. Um, so we always try and find ways to like, what was that thing, Barry, we were going to do with, uh, with what's her name? We were going to teach. She was, she had these classes where people can come in because you can, you can get your medical card and grow six plants or something like that, like California used to be. Yeah. But I would yeah. actually go in and consult with these people so that they can grow their own medicine and sell it to dispensaries if they want, you know, just set up a, a four lighter in their garage. Um, but I, my, my point was just, it, it, it's difficult going in to other states because they're trying to keep it all, uh, you know, within the state. They don't want outsiders coming in. And so, I think, you know, I think what, what Brent was, what, what Brent was alluding to is that like, there's, there's a big social equity component to how we approach out of town. Like, we are that we are those guys from California. We are coming into, you know, sometimes densely populated African American communities, and the idea is that we're going to come in and try to make a bunch of money, and and we want to make sure that we deliver the message that that's that's not exact. We we understand the gravity of what we're trying to do, and we want to lift the people up around us. Like in Oklahoma, we have a 92% local hiring uh, rate. Wow. You know, uh, that's pretty. That's pretty darn good. Yeah. You know, that's pretty good. And I can't wait to do that in cities like St. Louis, in cities like Kansas City, in cities like Detroit, where we can go in because a lot of the social equity programs are designed to just basically grab a straw person, put them as your, you know, 50% partner, and then give them a bunch of money. And I don't believe that's the best way to approach it. We, we have, you know, we already do a lot of community outreach. We already work with the downtrodden, the sick, the poor. We do that every day of our lives through Gobble Gobble Give, through Skid Row Christmas. You know, we're, we do it every day, literally being on Skid Row every single day. So we understand what it means to, to, to lend a helping hand. And our, and our approach is let us teach you to fish so that you can eat every day. Let us, let us teach you what we know. Let the, let the two white guys from California come out and surround themselves with local people and teach you everything that you got so that you can carry that strength and that pride and that knowledge with you moving forward. And, uh, and, and so we're, we're just excited about it. You know, <laughs> whether it works or not, we'll see, we don't know, you know, we're, we're giving it our best, but no, you, um, you guys are you know, both but, super but, insightful. Um, what advice, and I, I'm really excited to hear your answers to this question. What advice do you have for other entrepreneurs? Brent, I'll let you, I'll let you. <sighs> yeah. I mean, it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work. Um, it, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of new people getting in involved and, uh, I'm hearing a lot of horror stories. Um, but you know, then again, if you partner with the right people or if, if you have the right consulting, um, you know, you can do pretty well. 
Um, but, uh, you know, our, like our, our Instagram, uh, Tradecraft Farms, has done very well. And, it, and the reason why is because we've shared all of our techniques over the years. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, commercial growers would not share their techniques. So we have a lot of mom and pops, a lot of these kids that are growing at home and we're teaching them how to grow on Instagram, which is super cool. And we get a lot of respect because of that. I'm even seeing a lot of like goat emojis lately. Barry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's cool. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's not as easy as you think it is. It's it's a very very tough. It's very very competitive. Um, but you know, if, if this wasn't my passion, I don't know. I don't think I could be doing this at this wow. level. So that's why I always tell people yeah, that are sure. new. And I'm like, make sure you have people on your team that are passionate, either about cultivating or retail or just the cannabis plant in general. Um, because that's a, that's a big part of success right there. What about you, Barry? Yeah, there's, yeah, I'll, 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 uh, I'll add to that. And, and, uh, you know, back in, back when I was young, like Brent, um, yeah, cause I'm the old dog in the room now. Um, you know, I, I did all of my self-help tapes and I listened to all my Tony Robbins and the Zig Ziglar and they all say the exact same thing. And it's what Brent just said. If you're getting into the cannabis business to be rich, find a different business. Just find a different business because you will never be great at anything if it's not something that you love, you know? Brent truly loves what he does. And that's why I respect him so much. He really does love it, you know? And he's, you know, by, by bringing me in, I've really gotten to just love what I do. Like, I really do enjoy it. This is, we are playing Monopoly now. We're playing Monopoly on a big level, you know? And, and, and it's exciting. It really is exciting. But if you're just getting into the business now, if you're just, you know, you've got this business plan to, you know, sell weed to make a lot of money and be rich, you know, you should maybe rethink it because you have to start from a place of total respect and from total, you know, total love. You have to, you have to love what you do. And, and that's the first, first rule of any business and anyone that that's successful will tell you that. It's really, really great to have this opportunity to get to know you both, like at the same time. You play off each other really well, so I can only sort of imagine, uh, you know, what, what the day-to-day -day business operations are like. Uh, where can people find out more about you, uh, your social media, that sort of stuff? Uh, like our IG yeah. handle oh, right. is, yeah, our IG handle is tradecraft underscore farms. And then we have, uh, you just search Instagram, uh, sticky vape and either one of those, just, you can Google search, uh, trade craft, sticky vape, uh, dub brothers. I'm not sure. I don't know if I've ever even Googled that, yeah. but great guys. That's, that's Barry and Brent. Barry and Brett Walker, the founders of California-based Dub Brothers. Uh, really, again, thank you guys for coming on the show. Uh, you know, I, this has been great. I, I hope that uh, we can have you on again, um, you know, as, you, as, as your expansion continues. So, so thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. For sure, man. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, TG. Yeah. Bye. Can, All right. Stay safe out there. Working on it. You can find more episodes of the Gondrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section at Gondrepreneur.com and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gondrepreneur.com website, you'll find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily, along with transcripts of this podcast. You can also download the Gondrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. Uh, this episode was engineered by Trim Media House. I've been your host, T.G. Brandfault. <laughs>